800. And we are back on 1210 WCAU at 1246 in the morning. And for what it's worth, Alexander German has joined us here in the studio. Let's see if we can get her on. Alexander, how you doing? Good morning, Steve. I hope you're going out over the air. Hopefully. <laughs> Kevin, we got Alexander? We do. Okay, fine. Listen, tell us about Star Trek Four. You, um, you actually were the first person I saw at the station here. Um, Who had seen it. <laughs> and uh, I really do respect your opinion. As a matter of fact, uh, you were kind enough to give me uh, one of my major compliments uh, on an article I wrote on the 20th anniversary of Star Trek. That's right. I'm very grateful for it. Really an excellent article. Well, uh, As I said, I didn't thought you had it in you. <laughs> Um, by the way, I'm not looking for compliments here, but the reason I mention that over the air, so you don't think that I'm an obnoxious jerk, is the fact that um, Alexander is a hardcore trekker, and um, I say that with a great deal of love and respect. Thank you, Steve. Uh, well, seriously, I, I, besides, I have been watching Star Trek since September 8th, 1966. I was, I was born right in 1966. Oh, this is almost, almost a month after Star Trek premiere. Incredible. Well, let's see. Um, Star Trek War. Star Trek I was one of the people... Screwing over your age, but... <laughs> no, it is, I was one of the people who was fortunate enough to see the Star Trek preview Tuesday night. Our sister station, WCA UFM, had the preview that evening. Right. And I was fortunate enough to be able to see that showing. And then, yes, having seen it, I then went Wednesday morning, was in line at a quarter of 7 a.m. in the pouring rain with several of my friends. And we went in and saw the show again. And... What you were just saying with the previous caller in terms of the humorous parts and the fun parts of it all, quite frankly, I'm not really a very big fan of this movie. I really liked Star Trek II and really Star Trek III, the big serious movie, a lot better than Star Trek IV. Well, Star Trek II, of course, uh, is probably the most fun of all the films. Uh, in terms of writing, in terms of acting, in terms of plotting, Star Trek III is a much of a film in the series because even though it's very, very heavy-handed, and even though, uh, as a lot of people said at the time, it seems to be very Shakespearean in its structure, its middle-aged onk. There was, there was one reviewer that said that Star Trek III was like a Wagnerian opera in its heaviness, and I agree, but I really like that a great deal. I think it also got much, much closer to the original um, concepts or precepts of the series. I found someone who agrees with me. Everyone else, all the reviewers say that Star Trek IV is undoubtedly the best, is, is the best, and... I think that Star Trek IV is going to be the uh, the major crossover film. I don't know how well known this is, uh, although it, it's very easy to find this out if you simply read one of the, uh, the major articles out on Star Trek IV at the time. And by the way, this is the media film at the moment, uh, not only because it's the only major holiday film out uh, for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Uh, and I guess we're talking about the, the Christmas season, even though it started three weeks earlier this year than last year. Usually it comes out uh, for Christmas. It was a nice week. surprise that the movie came out as early as it did. Well, actually, it's following uh, on the, the heels or, or on the gloves, whatever cliche you use, of Rocky IV from last year. Uh, Rocky IV took in, uh, you and I were talking about this today, I think $31.8 million in the first five days, the first weekend, as they call it. Star Trek IV should do better than that. And that's a pleasure, by the way, because that means the, the picture will have basically earned back its original cost. Which will be week, nice. Which is incredible. I've been saying to a lot of my friends, you know, go out and see the movie at least twice so there'll be a Star Trek VI, because we already know there's going to be a Star Trek V. There definitely will be. Uh, as far as Star Trek IV is concerned, the reason I call it a crossover movie is you really didn't have to be uh, a Trekker or even a Trekkie, which, as we all know, is a somewhat derogatory yes. uh, term for people who jumped on the on the, uh, the Trek bandwagon, whatever, the Trek uh, ship yeah. uh, late in the game. But um, you really didn't need to know that much about Star Trek. Not at all. The, this one, you don't need to know anything about Star the Trek. The humor is very universal. I mean, Tuesday night at the preview, there were there was a friend of mine there who has never even seen Star Trek, mm -hmm. has never seen an episode, has never seen any of the movies, and she loved it. She absolutely loved it. As a matter of fact, this Sunday we are getting together to see Star Trek II on videotape, Star Trek III, and then go out and see the movie. And because she's never seen any Star Trek before, and she loves the film, she wants to see more, just on what she saw with Star Trek IV. Well, Star Trek IV is uh, surprising a lot of people because it is... Uh, basically a comedy, as, as you mentioned before, and as I've been mentioning. Uh, what, upset, what upset you about the film is that you can't quite accept the fact that after two and a half years... After two and a half years, I waited all this time! You 
getting one of the comedy episodes of the series on a big screen, right? Yeah, just, just thinking about it, you could almost, but not quite, compare it to The Trouble with Tribbles. It's a serious plot. I mean, you know, as the preview Much show, the... Than Trouble with Tribbles. True, but, you know, as the preview say, the Earth is on the verge of destruction, right. and it's a serious plot, but a lot of it is it's treated very humorously like The Trouble with Tribbles. It's done very well. Um... Well, there are a couple of things about the picture which I, which I, especially Robin, a couple of things about it which I really don't like at all. Uh, one of the things I do love about it which you don't like is the fact that some of the lines uh, seem to be making fun of the series itself. Uh, there is a line in the movie uh, that, that Bones, Dr. McCoy, says. Yes. Which actually, um, I guess, crosses that, that fourth wall um, between the, the audience and the characters on the screen where he says that Spock really has gone. Or, is it know, my God, Spock, gone. you he have really gone where no man has gone before. before. Uh, that cracked me up, but I can understand a lot of people who are really into Star Trek might uh, take offense at that because it is kind of lampooning the, the uh, raison d'etre for the, for the series. Agreed. I just, I just really miss the serious aspects that there were. As a, as a serious Star Trek fan, what I have always enjoyed most about Star Trek has been the relationship among the characters, and that is in Star Trek IV. The characters are terrific, but I miss I miss several degrees that are missing in this film. You know, very serious relationships that were there are, are not present in this movie, and that's what I miss. That's what I dislike about the film the most. Really? Unfortunately, yes. I mean, I, I had major expectations for this film, you know, standing in line in the rain and going to the trouble to get preview tickets, and I guess I really have been disappointed after two and a half years. At this point, with Shatner saying that a serious movie is in the offing, I right now am looking forward to Star Trek V more than looking forward to going back to see Star Trek IV again today. Okay. Hang on right there. Can we, uh, keep, can we keep here? I'll we'll go anywhere. Okay, fine. All right. Please stick around. The number is 839-1210 in Philadelphia. In the suburbs in South Jersey, it's 541-1210. I still got jet lag, but uh, with your help, we'll uh, manage to get through this morning. And if you want to talk about Star Trek or anything else, please pick up the phone and give us a call at 839-1210 in Philadelphia and the suburbs or in South Jersey at 541-1210.
Um, we have been talking about, among other things, Star Trek IV. Star Trek IV is very, very close to my heart, not only because I have, uh, over the years, been a Trekker, but have also managed to, uh, I guess, be, be fortunate enough to uh, strike up a friendship with Jimmy Doohan, who's been on the show a couple of times, with Leonard Nemo, I've met him a bunch of times. I'm not name-dropping, I'm simply telling you that, uh, like a lot of Trekkers, I have actually gone out of my way and been fortunate enough to meet some of the people who've been instrumental in the show's success. And for what it's worth, most of them are extremely nice people. William Shatner, over the years, has been known to uh, display an awful lot of ego. If you've seen Star Trek IV, or if you're planning on doing it, and once again, I'm only probably talking about 100 million people here, you'll notice that William Shatner looks better in this film than he has in the last, I guess, 15 years, and he has a much, much better time of it. One of the reasons for that is the fact that Leonard Nimoy is a man who has very, very little ego, to the best of anyone's knowledge, and who also was the director of this film and was obviously uh, tremendously involved in the writing. He's one of the co-writers. Uh, he's very secure. He gave most of the good lines to William Shatner and to his co-stars. He really took care of the, the crew members, and by, by the crew members I'm referring to Jimmy Doohan, uh, who plays Scotty, Michelle Nichols, who plays Uhura, uh, Walter Koenig, you should pardon the expression, who plays uh, uh, Mr. Chekhov. The reason I say you should pardon the expression, by the way, is because Walter is a well-known crybaby. When the film is not being made, or just after the film comes out, he always writes an article for Starlog in which he complains about the... Uh, the brevity of his parts, but we love Walter anyway, bless his pointed little Russian head in the film, because, listen, I'm opinionated, but I'm lovable, right? I'm a movie lover, I'm a trekker, I'm allowed. And, uh, of course, uh, George Takai as uh, Mr. Sulu, uh, Takei, as Alexander says, but we'll fight about that later on. Meanwhile, back to the phones, 839-1210 in Philadelphia and the suburbs in South Jersey, 541-1210. Before I go to the phones and talk to, uh, to Jay about Star Trek, let's see if I can get Alexandra back here for just a few more minutes. Uh, Alexandra, you are back with us. Say hello. 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 Okay, fine. And hello. you've got a friend with you named Joe Gundy, who is a film student. Gunder. Gunder, who is a film student at uh, Temple oh, University. Okay. Joe, uh, what did you think of Star Trek for? Very quick. It was great. It seemed to... Good evening. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, they can hear you. Okay. Uh, I, the first time I saw it, I thought it was great, but um, it had some problems. Like, first of all, what really got me, you're dealing with the 23rd century here. And there's, there's a lot going on in the, in the, in the 23rd century. Mm -hmm. But why, why must you, why, why do you have to go back to the 20th century for the sake of a movie? I mean, well, the there's, there's, there's a lot happening in the 23rd century. You could do, there's a lot that can happen in the 23rd century, right? I suppose in this particular case, it, it was the, uh, not only the most expedient thing to do as far as time travel being very, very popular. It was used twice in the series. Absolutely. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the episodes, which is The City on the Edge of Forever, is one of most Trekkers' oh. favorites. Not one of mine, by the way. Not just, not just crew members going back, but taking the whole starship with them. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole point for me is that it gave them an opportunity to pull a very, very old trick, which, of course, is to juxtapose uh, a person in time and to get involved in some of the obvious jokes. Do you remember a picture called Time After Time? Oh, uh, yeah. You've got H.G. Uh, Wells oh, yeah. trying to figure out what um, a McDonald's is, trying to figure out what, what money All is, trying to, out, yeah, right. trying to figure out... French Trying to figure out what a pay telephone is. And they are very, very cheap jokes in Star Trek IV. They go for the same kind of jokes. But it works because you've got someone with the incredible dignity of Mr. Spock coming, I mean, all the timing in the film, and once again, I'm not only giving credit to Leonard Nimoy for this, but also to the people involved in the writing of it, uh, Harv Bennett and uh, even Nicholas Meyer, Nicholas Meyer. part of the expression. But, little, little comic uh, bits such as Spock and Kirk getting on a bus, the doors close, the doors open immediately, they walk back off, and Spock says, what exactly did he mean by exact change? You don't even need to go on the bus. Exactly. You just walk in but on and still walking off. The whole idea. I agree with you that uh, there's an awful lot to be said for the 23rd century. I guess they did it for this uh, uh, film because, once again, time travel happens to be in, and the most important reason, and you've got to remember that movies are made to make a profit. I'd love to believe that this movie was made for all the trekkers out there, but it was actually made to make a profit. It was made for the people of 1986. Well, but also, it was, I guess, about three times as inexpensive, or how about one-third as well, expensive yeah, to let's... make it in the 20th Oh, yeah, let, let's, go to, let's go to the streets of San Francisco so, and shoot there. Exactly right, but I loved it. If that's your only complaint, um, I don't know what to tell you. I think it's... Uh... Other than a few filmic elements here that I noticed, they, they crossed the line of action here and there. Other yeah, than that... Okay, I'll right, see so what we're going to do here. Um, 
we are going to have to wrap this up fairly quickly, but let me go to the phones and see if I can find Jay. Jay, you're on 1210 WCAU. You want to talk about Star Trek? Hi. How you doing, sir? Yes. Um, I heard uh, your producer's comment about the, uh, the white martyrs of the movie. Right. And I thought that... I thought with the previous two movies, I thought they had enough of the of the of the group of doom stuff. And it went to death and the death of Spock and the death of the Enterprise. And I thought this was just a letter to Boy's way of telling us, you know, not to take this stuff too seriously, you know, just to have a sense of humor about this. And you know, I was I was very satisfied with the movie. Well, I I've gotta say that obviously I uh, I join you in that and I think that most uh trekkers, most Star Trek aficionados, uh will agree with you. It is true that in science fiction particularly and in, uh, and in Star Trek especially, you can get much more dramatic, much more philosophical uh, because 